I'll do a brief intro. Okay, Kieran. Uh, first of all, folks, welcome to Thursday, November 9th. This is PulpCon 2023. We're starting our first session. Kieran, I'm turning it over to you. Okay. Um, so yeah, my name is Quirin. Uh, I work on the PulpDev plug, or I'm a maintainer for the PulpDev plugin, and I wanted to have a discussion session today, developer focus on or on the possibility of introducing a sub-repository concept into Pulp. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna head into that in a minute. I mean, it's possible one could introduce this in just one plugin to begin with, but I think of it as a Pulp core feature that could be useful to multiple plugins. So I will frame in it, frame it in that way, even irrespective of, of, of where we go with it. Um, so I have prepared a problem statement, which I, which I tried to formulate in a plugin neutral way, which is, um, so some content types may have meaningful subsets within a given repository. And then if you have such a situation, the pulp plugin must record not only what repository a particular content unit is stored in, which is usually handled by Pulp Core automatically because in the repository content table. Um, but you also somehow need to know what subset or grouping within that repository your content is in. Mm -hmm. And so the the I guess the the best case scenario, which I put as an exception there, is maybe there is some natural way to query for the subset. Right. So the example would be, I don't know, all the packages of a particular architecture, they probably have an architecture field on them anyway, and you have a very simple query and find all the packages of a particular architecture. Um, and then I put some other examples there. So the one that I motivated this session is the apt repository components. So in Debian world, repositories are subdivided into different components and then well, divided into distributions, which are then subdivided into components. And you can think of it as one, one distribution component co combination being one grouping. Uh, and then, but another one might be RPM module streams. So now I've heard that maybe there isn't that much demand for improving module stream handling in pulp RPM, but it's something that yeah, if one ever wanted to implement it really nicely so that you don't have like offload all responsibility for creating modules to metadata on the user, one would somehow need that kind of grouping in for the module stream as well. Um, then just a little point that propped up under ad additional considerations is right um, right now in pub core, you, the, the, the set that is usually operated upon is the repository version. And most, most of the tools that Pulp Core provides for us work on the repository version. And so if you had a sub-repository, you could have autom sort of ideally automatically everything could apply to the sub-repository as well as, as the repository. OK. So mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Maybe at that point, we should add that the subdivision is in a hierarchical way so that you can really say, okay, it's like the left branch of my whole repository and the other part is the right branch of my repository. And there's not much overlap. Yeah. So, I mean, I was, I think that's true. There's a, there's a question whether there's just one way a sub-repository concept of, could work or whether okay. different plugins would need have like different requirements for sub repositories. Um, but so yeah, I was going to now go a little bit more into details of pulp depth's current problem. And then we can maybe make it more concrete and then make it more general again from that. Um, okay, so what does pulp depth currently have? And today we have something called package release components, and there I often refer shorten that to PRC, uh, which is a content type. Doesn't have any artifacts. It just records 
this package is in this release component. So it's basically a table with two foreign keys and nothing else. Um, and yeah, so it's basically going to go along with your packages in your repository version. And it's going to say, so these packages within this repository version are now in this release component because there's a package release component that says so. Um, yeah, it inherits from content and has no associated artifacts. So I already wrote that. And the big problem with that is that A, it just simply doubles the amount of content in your repository in the number of like packages that are originally in your repository. Um, and actually it's a little worse than doubling because basically for each package plus PR, so, so each package will have usually one package release component telling it what component it's in. And so in, in terms of like records in the database, you're gonna have a pulp core recording. This package is in this repository version. You're gonna have pulp core recording. This package release component is in this repository version. And then you're gonna have the package release component itself saying, this package is in this release component. So you actually have three records saying this thing is in this grouping instead of one. And so the, the big bit problem there is just sort of overall sync time efficiency because there's just no way to get that down. Even if the individual package release components are pretty simple, they're just two foreign keys, they add extra time and everything grows large and all the operations that query the entire repository version become less efficient. So it's there's a hard limit there how efficient this approach can be made. And then there's some consistency issues. So like what happens if a package is removed from the repository, but somebody or the code forgets to also remove the package release component and you have a dangling package release component that's completely meaningless. Um, it's also uh, not very uh, intuitive for users because it's a content type. So users interact with it via the API and it's basically saying users have to deal with a bunch of our internal plumbing uh, because we chose to build it this way. Um, right, so I think, I don't know if I need to say anything else about this being a problem. It's a like, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, there may be other solutions for it than just a sub-repository concept, but I think it's the only one I've really been able to come up with. Uh, so I might just go now into how that might work in, for this case. Um, so the idea is that each sub-repository within sub given up repository would represent one release component. The packages would be contained in the sub-repositories. They would not be in contained directly in the parent repository at all. And then the parent repository would contain the release component content, which is also a content type that already exists. And this release component content type could then point at a particular sub-repository version. And maybe there's some different way of handling this. Maybe you could have the reference somehow directly in the class parent repository version or something, or maybe you have it like this, that there's a content type that points you at the sub, but you need some kind of mechanism for point saying, okay, so this, parent repository version basically is a pointer at these three sub-repository versions. Mm. Um, and those references can't change, right? I, well, the, a repository version is considered immutable. Yeah, so, so I think the idea would be if you did it like this, if you create a new repository, like parent repository version, it would have a new repository content in it pointing at a different sub-repository version. So during sync, it would go something like this. Okay, I've gotten 10 new packages for this component. I'm gonna add them to the sub-repository. That's gonna create a new sub-repository version. And then I'm gonna create a new parent repository version that says, 
I'm now pointing at this newer sub-repository version, something like that. So yeah, it's yeah. like that's at and least like my, my naive idea how it would yeah. work. And at the same time, it would still keep the other uh, references to the other uh, release components that didn't change. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, a bit the same as it is now, right? You you have a new parent repository version, and one one release component changed, so the old one has been removed and the new one has been put in, and the other ones have stayed the same, so they're still in that newer mm -hmm. version. So one issue I'm, I'm I realized I'm tripping over um, over some nomenclature here. Every time I hear repository, I'm also hearing a thing that has to be that is publishable and distributable because th that's the other part of repositories they're just not they're not just bags of of stuff right they they have there are implications of that word in pulp in terms of um uh the metadata of a thing called a repository like in file, you mm. put a bunch of stuff in there, but then you publish it, and now you have a pulp manifest that knows about it. In RPM, you put a bunch of stuff in there, and now you publish it, and now you've got a repo md.xml and a primary and a file list and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and so, and which is which is this is to some degree sideways of your proposed design here. I just keep tripping over the word repository because the, as I'm listening, it really sounds like it's it's a container which we also can't use because that has its own usage <laughs> in the pulp world it's a bag of you could call uh, it a content a, set maybe a set or a group or something like yeah. that um, i'm trying to get away from the the um semantics of repositories as i'm reading this document because most of what we're describing here is not doesn't have repository semantics it has grouping semantics which is useful and it doesn't change any of what you're writing here other than the word repositories. Matthias, sorry, go ahead. Um, actually, I, I disagree okay. completely because a repository really is just, or let's say the repository version really is just a bag of content in there. And the whole concept, concept of publishing it and distributing it is already nicely separated into the publication and distribution models. Not from the human being's point of view. From the outside of Pulp, somebody says, I have a repo and I create it, correct. I publish yeah. it and I distribute it. And this is part of this is what do people think who come to this to this thing from the outside? This isn't about naming classes because we can name them all Bruce if you want to, but what does it look like from the outside, from the human being who's trying to understand this architecture? And we so, already trip on stuff like this inside of Pulp. So So yeah. I was thinking um, that they wouldn't expose sub repos to users. They would just be releases, right? But in the back end, they would be sub repos. But the user so, would be. so yeah, that's a possibility. I certainly think so. I so at least in the pub Debian case, I don't think of the sub repository as something that is standalone and interesting to users in particular because. But you couldn't publish it on its own. But maybe you could in some theoretical sense, but it wouldn't really be a useful thing to do. Um, so also like I've been so it's one of the questions I have listed here. Like, could there I think of it as a pretty tightly linked thing. So if you have a sub-repository, it or or a content grouping or whatever you want to call it. I'm gonna keep calling it sub-repository now, but sure, point sure. stands. <laughs> Uh, if you have a sub-repository, I think it would be owned by by the parent repository, and like I would be hesitant to say something like the same sub-repository can be included in multiple different parent repository just because that opens a can of worms and like um, a whole new level of uh, orphan cleanup, right? So, so right now my my, my first thought would probably be just be like. The sub-repository is not an independent entity. It belongs to a parent repository. If the parent repository is deleted, the whole thing is deleted. And um, if a different parent repository happens to need a sub-repository version that already exists on some other sub-repository of some other parent repository, it just creates another one. Mm -hmm. so, so, and then, and that then goes to David's point. If one did 
have it that way. It could all be internal plumbing and you could say, there's maybe not an API for it to the user and the user just like adds a package to the parent repository and then he needs to provide a component because the, the, the implication for an app repository is every package needs to live in some component within that parent repository. Uh, but but assuming the API says, okay, you want to upload a package into this parent repository or just normal re repository from the user's point of view, um, you need to provide me a distribution and a component that I'm going to put it in. And then I do all the rest. And in the background, I create a sub repository for this distribution component. The, yeah. And, thing. and that, so um, that's just like my internal record keeping of where, where the package lives is right. in this subgrouping. So um, that's the place, hmm. the place where we've run into, or I've run into issues in RPM has a, there's some overlap with what we've done in RPM because of the RPM ecosystem. But one of the issues you run into is uniqueness definitions. Like you said, well, what if a different place over there needs the same thing? As soon as you say the same thing, my immediate question is, what does that, what does that mean? What's the, what are the natural keys that describe this relationship? And how do you know that repo A with this, this set of objects is, is syncing? the same as repo b next door and if you don't you're not careful to think about that we have run into problems on the rpm side of things where because of the the initial implementation of kickstart trees which in rpm land are exactly and entirely sub repositories with all the semantics they have metadata um, you can get at them independently from the parent that they live in they they're they have all the stuff that a repository does um, and the initial implementation was just you have a you have this 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 thing that knows it belongs to a parent repo but because of the way we identified uniqueness if i had an upstream um uh pulp that had synchronized say you know uh rel 7 and all of its kickstart trees into four different repositories so the data is deduplicated on the upstream pulp but there's four different repositories that all point at the same stuff and then on the downstream, you say, hey, I want you to sync all of those to recreate a, a copy of the upstream into my downstream. We ran into some horrific concurrency problems because you had four different repos that were all trying to touch the same sub repository at the same time, which is a never happened case. Um, and it causes concurrency problems. And in some contexts, some and it, there is a context in which even worse, it meant that there was a repo version out there that could, whose content could change out from under you because the content was that it had used this composite concept. Um, and so the parent repository, all of its content looked like it was fine because it has a sub repo and the sub repo metadata didn't change, but the content of the sub repo did. And that's not reflected in the, Hey, I need to create a new repo version at the top level. Um, which mm -hmm. meant that the distributed version that was out there, you look at it on a Monday and the kickstart tree has a set of data in it. And you look at it on Tuesday and the parent looks the same and says, Hey, I've had no changes, but the kickstart repo has. And it be, so the, these are the kinds of um, things that, that we've been burned by in the past, um, which ha which is not, I don't know. I don't believe this is my first light on this document, but I don't think that your proposal here has that problem depending on how carefully it's implemented because you've carefully said any change to this this composite object this we'll call it a repository in this context any change to it is going to is going to cause a new repo version in the parent because you've made a change to the thing that it yeah. points to and it's careful you've carefully defined that two deb repositories that look exactly the same, that are being synced at exactly the same time, are not going to be creating the identical entity, even if all of their identifiers are the same. It's not gonna be the same entity, it's gonna be a new copy of this composite object. And I wanna, I wanna think hard about that. I don't have an answer, but I wanna think hard about that from the context of, I'm in Pulp, I'm writing Python code. I say, hey, go find me this sub-repository object. What does that mean? How do I ask that question? 
if two of them can be exactly the same and yet they're different. That's just the kind of thing yet that that one needs to think about pretty hard in this context. And that sounded it made way more sense in my head than it did coming out of my mouth. My apologies. No, it makes sense to me. Okay. Uh, um, what I think is key in the idea here is that you basically make the repository version of the sub repository a content. And in pulp, all repository versions are always immutable. And so yeah. it's content. So the moment you say, I have the whole sub repository as a content, then this concept doesn't work. But as, as long as you say, okay, um, I want to make a repository version part of my other repositories version, I believe the immutability at least is solved from press principles. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a, I think, I think, yes, it, well, again, of course, it depends on how, how you would implement it. But in this particular case, if you say, so this sub repository is really attached to one particular parent repository. And in the parent repository version, there's a reference to a sub repository version. And that thing cannot be deleted on, as long as it's still being referenced by something, then you're pretty safe. And like, if another apt repository is actually the same repository, but being in a separate repository, well, it's still just going to be, it's going to have its own sub repository and its own sub repository versions. And those may have the same content in them, which may be referencing the same artifacts, but those are already separate mm -hmm. concepts mm -hmm. in pulp land. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think from that point of view, one could make this pretty safe. I did put some other questions on here. Um, so yeah, so can, the first one I put, I mean, I just threw up a bunch of questions and some of them are maybe more serious than others. So can multiple parent repositories reference the same sub repository? I already said, I don't think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. It would open mm -hmm. a can of worm and, and make all of these things you've said probably a problem. Um, how do users interact with the sub repositories? Yeah, I think, yeah, there are many reasons to say no. <laughs> um, so yeah, I formulated it as an open question. So does the user add a package directly to a sub repository and ask, then ask the parent repository to update its sub repository version reference? Uh, or is there, or does the user just add the package to the parent repository and that's what they see. And, and I think that's the better approach because like users don't like the whole thing with the package release components was also like users don't want to know about our plumbing. They want to know this is my repository and I have this package in it. And maybe I have some filter for tell me, give, give me a list of all the packages that are in this release component. I'm sure that's some. I think that's something the Microsoft team has, in fact, added to Pulp Depth, if I remember correctly. So you would say, as a user, I've got a dev repo. I have a dot dev I want to put into it, and I just upload it. Would, but repo. as a user, to the repo, as a user, am I also specifying, and it's part of uh, this release? You have to, because otherwise, Pulp Depth doesn't know where to put it. Under the hood. So part of the upload process is I want you to upload this package and I you have the user gives you the metadata that would be necessary to do this, as opposed to I can upload a naked package, if you will, and then I'll fill that stuff in later. Is that, this is me so, being so, ignorant. By so the way. when you when you're <laughs> like at the point where the user wants to add the package to a repository. Yeah, yeah. There needs to be the information of what so it's two strings, the distribution and the component in within the distribution that it's going to go into. And either like, so one could say something like, um, either it's a mandatory field on the up upload or the add content or whatever endpoint, mm -hmm. or there's a default value or something. And I'm leaning towards making it a mandatory field because uh, just 
I think it's something that the user does want to choice, uh, like want to have the choice and not just like discover later, hey, Pulp put this in the default whatever distribution and that's not a good naming scheme for me. Um, so yeah, but maybe I'm, I'm wondering whether David might have a view on this because they are such heavy users of the upload. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, uh, Matthias, thank you. I completely lost track of time because I find this really fascinating. Um, okay, yeah. I hate stopping this because this is such a good conversation, but we we are have a full schedule. Um, Kieran, at the end of the day, we have an open discussion on pulp pain points, which is just kind of an open forum. I have I would, to leave early today, so I can't do it today, okay. but I believe there's open discussion tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, yeah let me a good topic to continue tomorrow. I would love to. I would love to do that. Um, and over the course, once we get, we get um, uh, well, I'll start it on his, I will send you a link to one of the documents we pulled together on pulp RPM, which has some of the danger discussion in it. Um, but this is great. I would love to pick this up as part of tomorrow's session if, when, as you have time. Um, and we'll go from there. Does that sound good? Yep. I hate cutting this short, but we really want to. Yeah, be we, we want to. Uh, the schedule is fine. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Then very I cool. I guess we can. Uh, Let me end, end the recording. Record. Right here.